Good morning. My name is Audrey of Skarsiga. What we're doing here is it's a ladies through the Bible study. We're doing this chronologically. It's important to me that this is chronological because so many times we study the Bible in chunks and we don't get the big picture. By the time I get to the New Testament, we're going to get to things that we're going to say, oh, we know what that's about because we saw that in the Old Testament. Um, there, what you're going to notice is in the beginning, this is going to be, be me recording in my home and I'm not that comfortable with it. But we will be, by the time we get to Exodus, you'll see it's in a classroom setting. And I enjoy that so much more because there's the interaction. So I apologize for any dryness that there is at this point, but that's the way it is. Now let me tell you, I do not speak Greek or Hebrew. Um, I haven't been to seminary, but what I have done is I have researched. I spend three to four hours a day researching, uh, and I am very careful about who I use as my sources. My favorite is David Guzik. I use him a lot. But I have about 20 to 30 sources that I use. I've been studying the Bible for about 40 years. Let me tell you about me. I have been a Christian for that 40 years. I grew up in what I thought was a Christian home. Um, but it really wasn't. We went to church sometimes, not often. Um, by the time I was a teenager, I was very involved in my youth group, but our youth group was about partying. It wasn't about studying God. I can't remember one sermon. I grew up in a Methodist church, and uh, my heart wasn't in it. The word of God was preached, but I didn't hear a word of it. I just wanted to get back to the partying part. I got married to my high school sweetheart, and he had been um, led to Christ by someone from Campus Crusade. And so he, at 13, he, so he, he was saved, but the problem was there was no follow-up with him. So he knew he needed to study the Bible. He needed, knew he needed to plug into a church, but he had no idea what church. So he studied with all these different faiths, Christian faiths, and Seventh-day Adventist, Jehovah Witness, Mormon, um, Catholic. He just had such a, a mixed-up theology. Um, and me, I, I'm living as if I think I'm a Christian, but I don't know anything about Christianity. So my poor husband put up with me and um, my depression, my anger. Seven years into our marriage, we had a night where we decided we couldn't be together anymore. And we separated, like I said, one night. The next day we got back and we knew we, knew we needed something. We needed help. Um, but we didn't know where to look. A few months later, um, we were very involved with our little league. So a few months later, we... We were at our little league, David was coaching, I was on the board of directors, so was he. And a, a coach on one of the teams he coached asked him when he was going to try his church. And David said, I'll try tomorrow. Unfortunately, at the time, the kids had the chicken pox. So we couldn't both go. So David went the next day and he was so excited. And he came home and he said, you have to go to this. And so I went that evening. And uh, I really heard the word of God for the first time. And three weeks later, I was baptized. Before my baptism, I would yell and scream at the kids. Now, people will tell you they can hardly hear me talk because I talk so quietly. I don't know if I have the ability to yell anymore. Um, God saved me. And God has made such a difference in my life. He's given me peace. And I want 
everyone to experience the love and the joy and the peace that he gives. I mean, you can find that in his word. So let's get started. We're going to start with Genesis chapter 1. I'm using the English Standard Version. By the way, I am coming from a Southern Baptist point of view because I'm Southern Baptist, the church that we first went to that I heard the Word of God was Emmanuel Baptist Church in Highland, California, under Rob Zinn, and so blessed. And we've been Southern Baptists since. So um, we're going to be looking at word meanings of the original languages, what's going on in history. A fun part is that there's times we're going to look at Jewish folklore, and some of it is you know, really interesting stuff. We're going to talk about where theologians differ and why. And frequently I will not come in on one side or the other because these are very learned men. I'll, I'll present both sides. Um, one of my philosophies is when there is something that God really wants us to know, it's, it's very clear in the Bible. Um, we're going to look at where differing Bible, or where Bible translations differ. We're going to look at the historical context. Um, we're going to try to avoid putting our interpretations into the historical context. Um, and I'm going to try to stay on, on topic. You'll see that in the class. We sometimes chase rabbits, but we try to get back. So the Bible, it is the Word of God. Events in this really happened. They're not myths. In fact, throughout history, Archaeologists have have discovered more and more things that just back up what the Bible talks about. The Bible reveals the nature and the heart of God. Um, there's one message throughout. The redemptive acts of Jesus Christ. It's called the scarlet thread. We'll see that in Genesis and going all the way through. Um, it's not a book of science, yet it contains scientific pr truth. There's things that were written in the Bible that were written long before scientists came along and decided, oh yeah, I guess that's right. This was written over 1,500 years. Um, the earliest portions were written about 1,400 B.C. And the Old Testament ends with Malachi, which was written in 400 B.C. Then we'll have a 400-year gap between the New Testament and the Old Testament. And we're going to talk about what happened there because that is, really explains the world that Jesus came into. The New Testament was written between 44 and 95 AD. The Bible was written on three continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. There's more than 40 authors, and they are from so many different um walks of life. There's Jews and Gentiles, kings and paupers, highly educated and those with no formal education. You got religious leaders, political leaders, prophets, just everyday people, all writing and coming up with the same message because that message came from God. Now there's two major divisions of the Bible. There's 66 books in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there's 39 books. In the New Testament, there's 27 books. The Bible was written in three different languages. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew and some Aramaic. And the New Testament was written in Koine Greek. Um, Koine Greek is a historic language. It's an evolved language. It's still spoken. A dead language means no one speaks it. A, Historic language means they've adapted it. Think, uh, think King James English and Shakespeare. Shakespeare. We've way evolved from that. Um, and so that's the same kind of idea. Now, the Bible, each book was written, and it didn't have chapters, it didn't have verses. Those were not added until 1560 A.D., at this point, the Bible has been translated into over 1,090 languages. 
or at least parts of the Bible. The whole Bible has been translated at, into at least 190 languages. God's word is for the world. Okay, so, so Genesis. The word Genesis means beginning. There's a Hebrew legend that the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, they all really wanted to be the first letter of God's holy word. But in the end, the, word, the letter bet was allowed it, B-E-T, because he said, O Lord of the world, may it be thy will to create thy world through me, seeing that all the dwellers of the world give praise daily unto thee through me. As it is said, blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. For this reason, the Hebrew book of Genesis begins, Bereshet, God created the heaven and the earth. Bereshet means in the beginning. Kind of a cute story. So the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses, and they're called the Pentateuch. Penta means five. Tukos means a volume. Originally, it, it was one big book, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. One big book. But then they broke it up. There's at least 165 passages in Genesis that are quoted in the New Testament. Now, uh, there was a thing where people, uh, experts were saying Moses couldn't have written it because writing wasn't invented when Moses around, was around. But since then, another archaeological thing, they found some tablets, the Tel El Armana tablets in Egypt that took it back to the time of Moses. So Genesis has two parts. Genesis 1 through 11 is a general history, and from and 12 on is a history of Abraham and his family. So there were three men arguing over whose profession was first one on earth. Mine said the surgeon. The Bible says that Eve was made from carving a rib out of Adam. Not at all, said the engineer. An engineering job came before that. In six days, the earth was created out of chaos, and that was an engineer's job. <laughs> yes, said the politician, but who created the chaos? It doesn't matter whose job was first. So what do you say to someone who says the early chapters of Genesis are just a bunch of myths? Of course, we say, that is God's holy word. What a lot of people work on are theories, the theory of the Big Bang, and, and there's unexplained parts of it. God's word explains it all. In Genesis 1, we see the only creation story that, had, that mirrors scientific observation. We see planets and stars and moons, all the other... Um, creation stories don't include that kind of thing. The creation story tells how everything was created except God because God is not a created being. He always was. So there are, even within Christianity, there's different creation theories. There's one called theistic, the, theistic evolution God created the base, but evolution took over. Then there's the day age theory. It's a progressive creationism. God created, but he did it over long periods of time. And people usually throw in that verse that says that a day is as a, a thousand years to God to explain that. Then we have the gap theory. So that one says between verses one and two, there's a long gap. There was creation, and then everything was destroyed and started again, and in the first one were the dinosaurs and all of that. Then we have the six-day creationism, that the universe was created just the way the Bible says. Now, I said I don't usually cite on things. Well, when the Bible says it, that's, I will cite on that. I am a six-day creationist. 
So let's get into the word. We're going to take verses in little chunks and sometimes one verse like this first one. First one says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe this verse, you believe it all. If God is big enough to create, he's big enough for everything else that happens in the Bible. Um, so who's there to record all this? God must have given this history to either Moses or Adam because no one else was, there was no human being present to witness this. Notice who's the subject of the first sentence. God. Just as it should be. In Hebrew, God here is Elohim. El means God in the singular. Add the Ohim at the end, and it's plural. So when referring to the God of Israel, with the exception of six times, God is plural. So what does that mean? That means it's a trinity. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were together at the beginning. Um, they're plural, yet Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The word for created is singular. It was done by one person. Yet the person that did it is plural. So our, our brains just can't understand. Before everything was created, there was God. Where did God come from? Our brains can't understand it, but he was forever. He what always was, always will be. He was without beginning or end. God is separate from his creation. Even if the whole universe stopped, God would be there. When it uses the word create, it means making something out of nothing. Only God can make something out of nothing. That same word is used in verse 1, verse 21, verse 27. When we talk about making something out of nothing, we still have a base we still have something we're making out, making it into. God didn't have that boundary. So consider the greatness of God's universe. What do you look at and go, wowzers? I live in St. George, Utah, and oh my gosh, it is so beautiful here. I pray I never take it, take it for granted. It is like living in the middle of the Grand Canyon. It is so beautiful. But what is there that you look at and go, wow, I, I can, you can look at your hand and how it moves and go, wow. And that's the world God created. But he didn't just create it. He had a specific plan. He knew the mission of Jesus. He promised eternal life. He knew the cross was, was coming. He knew his grace would be needed and it would be given. And he knew that believers would be forgiven. Only an intelligent designer could create just right universe, not chance. So there's a book called The Fingerprint of God by Hugh Rice. Here's some things that he said. Um, were created by God and could only have been created by God. It ha the universe has to have just the right gravitational force. If it, if it were larger, the stars would get too hot and our earth and they would burn up too quickly and it would be impossible to support life. If it was smaller, the stars would be too cold and there would be no heat and light. So we have just right gravity. Have, the universe has to have just the right speed of light. If it were larger, stars would not send out much light. If it were smaller, stars wouldn't. Oh, if it were 
I'm sorry, if it were larger, stars would send out too much light. If it were smaller, it wouldn't send out enough light. It just, the universe has a, the water molecule is just right. It's polarity. If it were greater, um, the heat of fusion and vaporation would be too great for life to exist. If it were smaller, the heat of fusion and vaporation would be too small for life's existence. Liquid water um, wouldn't be able to sustain life. Ice wouldn't float. Everything would freeze. God created a beautiful and complex world. Machines are not as complex as our, our body. No one, again, no one but God can create things out of nothing. Sometime before this, God created the angels because in Job 38, 7, it says they witnessed the creation of the heavens and the earth. So there's going to be a pattern in this. God is going to form something and then he's going to fill something. In day one, he forms light. In day four, he fills that light with sun, moon, and stars. In day two, he makes the skies and the waters. In day five, he fills it with birds and fish. In day three, he creates the land and the plants. And then in day six, he fills it with animals and man. Verse 2 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was ho hovering over the face of the waters. Darkness on the face of the earth. That's a, that's a picture of a life without God. Darkness. That's, we don't want darkness. We don't gravitate to darkness. We like light. First thing God did was move on the waters. Before that, the earth was um, out of order. It was, had no form. It was empty. It was in confusion or chaos. When it uses the word hovering, it's, a, it's the word that is used for a mother bird over her eggs. And you can picture how protective that is. Um, there's a Persian fable that says God created the world um, as a vast plain and he sent his angels to sow it with, with flower seeds. But Satan was watching and he wanted to destroy it. He buried every seed underground and he called on the rain and, to fall and, um, and just rot everything. <laughs> so he thought. He thought he destroyed everything. But then the seeds started to grow, and they rose into the sunlight, and they opened into thousands of forms of beauty. The new world and all its wonder revealed the wisdom and power of its creator. Again, that's a, a Persian fable. It's a nice story. It's not what the Bible says. Verse 3 through 5 says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. God said, we're going to see that repeated over and over again. It means God willed it. He ordered it. And there was immediate result. In the original Hebrew, it actually says, um, God said, light be, light was. I like that. The first step from bring, bringing order to chaos was light. Notice there's light and day and night before there's a sun and moon. That's not until the fourth day. So um, how, do you, how do you have light without sun and moon? So, some theories. God himself is the light. Another theory is that the sun and the moon created. were already created, but they were hidden. Another idea is that Genesis 1 is not chronological. 
We're going to see that in several things that some sometimes the Bible isn't chronological. Me, I, I kind of I kind of like the one that God Himself is light because He is light. The Revelation says there's coming a new heaven and a new earth, no sun or moon, or sunbirds. God Himself will be the light. So in the in the end, He is the light. Why it? Why would you think he's not the light in the beginning? Notice it says there was evening and then there was morning. The Jewish day starts at sunset. So it makes sense that it started with sunset. So disagreement on, on what the days are. Are they literally 24 hours? Or does it mean a geological age? Um, the Hebrew word means 24 hours. So we're going with that. And God says, good. And he knows good. Good isn't just nice. The Hebrew means it's useful. It's, it was created for a purpose and it's, and it's fulfilling that purpose. Um, have you ever made something and said, hmm, good. That's, that's God. I mean, he really knows good. Verses 6 through 8. And God said, Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so. And God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. Um, so it's an it's an expanse of space. There's this canopy theory um, that I, I go along with. Um, so some theologians and scientists say that there was this water vapor blanket around the earth and it created a greenhouse effect. So it was nice and comfortable all the time inside that water vapor that was covering the earth. Um, it provided a reservoir so that the flood that we know is coming when God um, brings on the flood he just kind of pokes a hole in that vapor blanket and all that water comes gushing through there was no significant wind there was no rains as we know it it was a lush tropical vegetation a rich environment with a heavy dew or ground fog that Everything was just so lush and, and healthy. There was no radiation, ultraviolet radiation. And we know what that does to our skin and our bodies. So they lived longer lives because of this. Now let's look at verses 9 through 13. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and God saw that it was good and God said let the earth sprout vegetation plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind on the earth and it was so the earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed according to their own kinds and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. So God created the earth covered with water. Then he pulled the waters into one place and dry land appeared. Notice the plants sprout. They don't just appear, they grow. So no sun yet. How are the plants getting their nourishment? Um... God created these plants bearing seeds. In this case, the chicken came before the egg. Um, so, uh, still, how do they get their, how do they grow and, and nourish when you don't have a sun and moon? Of course, we have God as the light, so there is light. Um, some scientists say there were huge meteorites carrying amino acids 
and the impact of the earth at a time when the sun was cooler and the earth was a watery ball covered with ice up to a thousand feet thick. Um, the idea was that a meteor hit the ice, broke through and seeded the water um, and gave us the building blocks of life. So it assembled what's called an organic soup. However, this process was triggered. Scientists say life began on Earth in a geological instant. By an instant, they mean 10 million years or less. Um, and that information came from David Guzik. So we see the phrase, according to his kind, 10 times in this chapter. God allows variation within a kind. But something of one kind never develops into something of another kind in naturally. A pig will not become a plant. Um, a dandelion will not become a rose. They, on its own, everything stays within its own kind. It talks about every herb that yields seed. Some people say, say this justifies, justifies the use of drugs, especially marijuana, because God created every herb that yields seed. But it doesn't say that every herb is good for every purpose. Um, can you think of an example of a plant that isn't good for humans? Hemlock is definitely a natural plant, but you don't want to take it. You will not find in the diet Bible where drugs used for pleasure are ever approved. It's always condemned. In fact, they used it with sorcery and the occult. So there's nothing that says the use of recreational drugs is okay. Verses 14 through 19. And God said, let there be lights. Finally get in the lights. In the expanse of the heavens to separate the day and the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights. The greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. So the sun, moon, and stars have been used throughout history to measure time, to give direction. God knew exactly how far to set the sun from the earth, a few million miles more or less, and life would be impossible. Here's one of those Jewish legends. It connects the movement of the sun to the praise of God. The progress of the sun in his circuit is an uninterrupted song of praise to God, and this song alone makes his motion possible. Therefore, when Joshua wanted to bid the sun stand still, he had to command the sun to be silent. The sun's song of praise hushed. The sun stood still. When it talks about signs and seasons, it's probably talk about, talking about constellations. The word is Maseroth in Hebrew. So it's talking about the zodiac. There is a zodiac in every language and every culture. Um, even if the specific names of the constellations change. Now, the zodiac itself is not evil. All it means is the stars and the constellations. Um, now, when we look at constellations, they, they call them like Pegasus. Have you ever looked at Pegasus and seen a, a horse? They don't really look like that, but... Um, they gave them the names, and these names are, are the same in all the cultures. Um, 
this kind of points to a common pre-Babel beginning. All their language was the same when they named the constellations. Now, of course, people have taken those constellations, taken that zodiac, and corrupted it. Corrupted God's original message into, uh, into astrology, into some a fortune-telling thing. And God always condemns fortune-telling. He doesn't want us looking elsewhere for our future. He wants us to trust in him. It's universally condemned in the Bible. Exodus 22:18, Deuteronomy 18:10, Second Chronicles 33:6, Revelation 21:8 and 22:15. Now an interesting thing, the word in Hebrew for sorcery or in Greek for sorcery, pharmacia. Sorcery was tied with drugs. So, is there life on other planets? Um, they did a, a, uh, an evaluation, and for all the things needed for a planet to be in place, the probability is 1 in 10 to the 42nd power. So, it's not likely. It is possible, but it God would have to have everything in place again. And he may have chosen to do that. We don't know. The U.S. government spends $100 million a year looking for extraterrestrial intelligence. So they believe it could be. And again, it could be if God willed it. Verses 20 through 23. And God said, Let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves, and with which I'm sorry, with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good, and God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. All the birds and the creatures were created at once. Not, they didn't evolve. And see again, all animals were created according to their kind. Animals were not created out of plant life. Um, land creatures were not created out of sea creatures. God created them all. They didn't all develop out of one primordial cell, but out of the same designer. When it talks about variation with a, in a kind, um, it kind it example. It doesn't mean there's not differences within the kind. For example, dogs. How many different kind of dogs are there? Um, you have all you have wolves as a kind of dog, and you know canines. You have wolves, and you have um, your household pets, and but they're never going to evolve into mice, even with breeding. They're going to be dogs. I think they tried to try, turn them into mice when they created Chihuahuas, but that didn't work. Um, so they stay within their kind. Okay, so what about fossils? Don't they prove evolution? You know who opposed Darwin's theory of evolution the strongest? Were fossil experts. Um, Darwin admitted the state, this is according to David Guzik, Dar Darwin admitted the state of the fossil evidence was the most obvious and gravest objection which can be urged against my theory. And because of the fossil evidence, all the most eminent paleontologists and all our greatest geologists have unanimous, unanimously, often vehemently, maintained that the species do not change. There is no evidence for evolution in fossils. <sighs> so, not only were we created... God provided for our ongoing procreation. 
he wanted us to go on. Verse 24 um, and 25 says, And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to, their, to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Look at the variety of land animals. Um, think about God's sense of humor. What's the goofiest looking animal you, you can think of? You know, look at a platypus. Look at a peacock. You know, the with peacocks, the biggest tail attracts the peahen. Yet, <laughs> that big tail makes it hard for them to escape their predators. It is not survival of the fittest for peacocks. Again, they were made according to their kind. Verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Again, the word for God, he says, is Elohim. And he says, let us make man in our image. Yes, plural, one God in three persons, the Trinity. And it's not like Queen Elizabeth when she says, we shall inspect the troops. No, and she really means just herself. No, this is three in one. In the image of God, it helps us understand who man is. It's so important. It's mentioned twice. What we'll find is if something is really important, it's repeated. So this is, it, he said, in our image, after our likeness, it means it's important. We were made in the image of God. An image or likeness is slightly different. We were not clones of God. Um, image is our appearance. Um, the devil and the angels, they also have an appearance. Likeness. That's a similarity in an abstract way. Um, Righteousness is only found in men. Now, the word for man in Hebrew is Adama. Hmm. Where we get the word Adam. So what makes us different from animals? Here's some things that are unique in man alone. We're the only creatures that have a natural countenance to look upward. To see God. We alone have a variety of facial expressions. Some animals have some cute facial expresses, expressions, but not to the degree that we have. We alone have such a sense of shame that we blush. We alone speak. We can teach animals to speak in a way, but not to the degree that we do. We alone possess personality, morality, and spirituality. You may say animals have a personality, but they don't have the morality and spirituality that goes with it. By being created in God's image, it means we possess personality and knowledge and feelings and a will. Animals and plants don't have that. We have that Morality, we're able to make moral judgments and have a conscience about it. We have a spiritual spirituality. We're made for communion with God. And it's a on a level of spirituality that we speak with God. God has no physical or human body. God is spirit. There's times where he will appear to us in a, in a physical body. That's called a theophany. Um, but in his, that's just like a 
an extra suit he puts on. In reality, he is, has no physical or human body. But he creates our body to do many of the things he does. We can see, hear, smell, touch, speak. We can think and plan and, and so much more. The things that God can do. When it says he's given us rule or dominion, it means to trample down. That means that's pretty harsh sounding. But it, what it means is that we are to rule God's world as his representative in his character. It's not about the power. It's about how we exercise that power, how we are caring for what he's given us. Verse 22 through 31 says, So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. them. Uh, three times. How, how important is that? And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And so it was. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. So, again, he repeats that. He created man in his own image three times. That means get it through your six skull, thick skull. He created man in his image. He created man fully formed, not as a baby. He created him in one day, not gradually over millions of years, not through evolution. He created Adam. Um, male and female, he created them. Doesn't mean that God created Adam as some uh, androgynous being. But um, that he created them, created male and female. Um, this is one of those examples where things are not exactly chronological order. Where we don't, we'll see Eve's creation later. But um, here we see woman. Um, there are some that say there's no real difference between men and women. To God, the differences between women and men is not an accident. Our, our society is so messed up that way. Um, neither sex is superior, though. Man is superior being man. Women is, are superior being women. We're absolutely superior there. But when a man tries to be a woman or a woman tries to be a man, you have something inferior. The first thing God blesses is man. The first job on earth, take care of the earth, have authority over the earth. There is a command to have kids. They needed a population to fulfill God's plan. God gave a desire for sex. He to populate the earth quickly. Um, but it also means to live in peace with other families. Um, so notice what is given for food. At this point, only plants. Maybe before the flood, Everyone was vegetarian. In Genesis 9, after the flood, man's given permission to eat meat. So maybe before that, we they were all vegetarians. So God's final answer and analysis, this is very good. It's the first time he said very. When he says very good in Hebrew, it means the best. God is pleased with what he's created, even though he knows what is coming. But he's pleased with the way it looks now. At that time, it was entirely good. There was no death. 
or decay on the earth at all. There was no cancer. There were, was no COVID-19. It was a perfect world. And that was his design. It was a, an intelligent design. It was a, a balanced ecosystem. Now, the language. Um, some say that we went from grunts to a language. Um, but per, per some very knowledgeable linguistic professors, no, that's not possible. You can't have part of a language. There's no evidence of anyone evolving from grunts to a language. We had a language. So, could, could God have created the earth in one day? Why do you think he couldn't? Why do you think he didn't? Once Sir Isaac Newton had an exact replica of our solar system, made into miniatures. The planets were all geared together by cogs and belts and they moved around in an orbit in a perfect harmony. One day, as Newton was studying his model, a friend who didn't believe in the biblical account of creation stopped by. He just marveled at the device and he said, Mr. Newton, what an exquisite thing. Who made it for you? Without looking up, Newton said, nobody. Nobody, his friend asked. That's right, I said nobody. All these balls and cogs and belts and gears just happened to come together. And wonder of wonders, by chance, they began revolving in their set orbits and with perfect timing. That's what people would have us truly believe. Sir Isaac Newton, one of the geniuses of our history, didn't believe that. That is the end of chapter one. Next time, join us for Genesis chapter two. Thank you.